Hello everyone and welcome to a new lecture which combines two topics in the ECG course which are the myocardial ischemia and the arrhythmias and our lecture today is titled tachyarrhythmias with acute coronary syndrome so we are going today to learn the types and mechanisms of tachyarrhythmia that can occur in acute coronary syndrome and myocardial function per se and your mechanisms of course so I want at first to remember a famous quote that I learned when I was a cardiology resident, which is ischemic heart disease can present by anything in cardiology from SOS, from silent to sudden cardiac death. So ischemic heart disease is a very broad category in cardiological disease that can be asymptomatic, can present with chest pain, dyspnea, palpation, syncope, tachyarrhythmias, or bradyarrhythmia, or even sudden cardiac death. And that's why we combine these two topics together in this lecture today. Of course, we have tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmia, but we are focusing today on the tachyarrhythmias per se, and the bradyarrhythmias with acute coronary syndrome will be discussed in another lecture. Of course, we remember the mechanisms of tachyarrhythmias. We have the re-entry, we have a normal automaticity, and we have the triggered activity with its both pipe early and delayed after depolarization. We entry, of course, needs the presence of a substrate consisting of two pathways with different conduction velocity and refractoriness plus a trigger which is mostly a premature beat. So, for example, when we have this pattern here, the impulse pass anti-gradely in the pathways that have shorter refractory period and slower conduction velocity till it reaches the tail of the other pathway which have longer refractory period and faster conduction velocity which now has recovered from the refractoriness resulting in a re-entrant circuit as we mentioned before in the lectures of mechanisms of tachyarrhythmias. Also we have some types of re-entry like the AVNRT, APRT, atrial flutter, scar related VT and fascicular VT. Also we remember the automaticity which has both types enhanced and normal automaticity. Enhanced automaticity the focus is normally an automatic focus which is of course the SA node and now it shows enhanced activity and the abnormal automaticity the focus is not considered a normal automatic focus but now it shows an abnormal automatic activity like ectopic atrial focus or ectopic AV node and so we have three famous types of automaticity which are in a properly sinus tachycardia, focal atrial tachycardia and junctional tachycardia. We have, of course, the early after depolarization, which is a subtype of triggered activity, and it is characterized by the occurrence of after depolarization or after potential in phase three of the action potential, and this usually occurs in case of market action potential prolongation, bradycardia, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, hypomagnesemia, and with long QT interval. And so the most two famous type of early after depolarization are long QT syndrome and bradydependent VT. Also, we have the delayed after depolarization, in which the after depolarization or after potential usually occurs in phase four, and most it is related to increased intracellular calcium concentration. And so the delayed after depolarization leads to sometimes significant tachyarrhythmia. And intracellular calcium overload can explain the arrhythmias that can occur in deduction toxicity, idiopathic BVCs and VT ischemic injury in case of acute myocardial infarction and also reperfusion injury besides the famous chylopathy of catecholaminergic polymorphic VT. So the tachyarrhythmias here are explained by delayed after depolarization due to intracellular calcium overload. Of course, I have put a link for the famous lectures that we have presented in the ECG course, which is the mechanisms of tachyarrhythmia in order to give much more illustration for the types of arrhythmia and zero mechanisms. Now let's apply this in patients presenting with acute coronary syndrome or myocardial infarction because of course the arrhythmias are much more common in patients with MI rather in patients with unstable angina. Let's start with the re-entry. Re-entry usually occurs around the scar in a patient with ischemic LP dysfunction not in acute myocardial infarction so mostly re-entry would not be discussed a lot in this topic because it usually doesn't occur in acute myocardial infarction. Regarding trigger activity we have the early and the delayed Early after depolarization is usually related to bradycardia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, or long QT intervals, so mostly it is not very common to see it in acute myocardial infarction. But we can see delayed after depolarization, which can explain the ischemic injury or reperfusion injury leading to ventricular tachycardia, for example, and we have also the abnormal automaticity, which sometimes may occur with ischemic injury. So these are the two most famous mechanisms of tachyarrhythmia in case of acute myocardial infarction.
Let's now see these five famous types of tachyarrhythmia and apply them in the myocardial ischemia. Of course, sinus tachycardia is nearly the most common tachyarrhythmia to be seen because it can occur due to sympathetic stimulation with acute pulmonary syndrome or compensatory tachycardia like in case of acute pulmonary edema or cardiogenic shock as a homeostatic mechanism. So most of your patients will have sinus tachycardia. We have also atrial fibrillation as the primary venous trigger and the multiple wavelet through entry are the main mechanism. But it is very common to see AF in patients with myocardial ischemia, either acute coronary syndrome or myocardial infarction. And of course, most of you have seen a patient during his hostile course developing new onset atrial fibrillation. We also have ventricular tachycardia, which can occur due to, due to triggered activity caused by abnormal calcium handling, leading to increased intracellular calcium concentration and delayed after depolarization or abnormal automaticity. It can occur with ischemic injury or the reperfusion injury. So these are the three most common tachyarrhythmias in patients with myocardial infarction. Supraventricular tachycardia and atrial flutter may occur in patients with myocardial ischemia, although they are not very common to be seen, but it is not impossible to be seen in patients with myocardial ischemia. But we are going to focus on the first three types because they are very common to be seen. Of course, there is an important quote that you should record the ACG during any episode of tachyarrhythmia before termination, provided that the patient is hemodynamically stable. And don't forget, record the ACG plays after termination, because it may reveal the possible cause of the arrhythmia, which may need specific therapy. For example, it may show progadal syndrome, it may show that the patient has World Parkinson White syndrome, it may show features suggestive of structural heart disease, and it may even show ST elevation or see depression or significant or symmetrical T-wave inversion, suggesting that this patient is having high risk unstable angina, non stemi or even STEMI as the original cause for tachyarrhythmia. And so you should manage the original condition itself, not just the arrhythmia. So please don't forget these two codes, ACG during the tachyarrhythmia and ECG after termination. Let's first start with sinus tachycardia. And we need to understand why, why sinus tachycardia is very common in most patients. The answer is simple, sympathetic stimulation. We are speaking here about a visceral pain with a lot of sympathetic stimulation over activity due to the severe visceral pain, which is an anginal pain, either unstable angina or myocardial infarction. So it is not something strange that the patient will have sympathetic stimulation. Also, as we mentioned, compensatory tachycardia in response to hemodynamic compromise is a famous mechanism for sinus tachycardia, like for example, STEMI KILIP class three or KILIP class four. Let's see, for example, this here ECG here. We can see here that the patient has extensive anterior STEMI with tombstone appearance, as we mentioned before, as the ST elevation magnitude surpasses the R wave. And of course, we have sinus tachycardia here because I expect that this patient would have hemodynamic compromise because of the extensive myocardial infarction here. And so that's why we can see sinus tachycardia. We also have the atrial fibrillation. We mentioned before in the lecture of atrial fibrillation in the ACG course that atrial fibrillation needs a trigger and a substrate. A trigger that ensues, which is usually in the primary vein triggers, and a substrate that maintains the atrial fibrillation, which are the multiple wavelet re entries. So, an ectopic focus in the primary vein discharge impulse at high rate, and then the atrial myocardium with varying conduction velocity and refractories maintain it. So, now we need to understand how can an acute myocardial infarction cause AF? It can cause it by two mechanisms. Sometimes lift atrial infarction itself. Yes, atrial contains myocardial tissue, so it is susceptible to myocardial ischemia and AV infarction. And so this may induce atrial fibrillation per se. Also, in case of extensive infarction, like an anterior STEMI, for example, increased LV and diastolic pressure leads to increased lift atrial pressure, which can trigger atrial fibrillation in presence of a substrate. That's why presence of AF indicates a worse prognosis in this patient because it indicates a longer, or sorry, a larger magnitude of infarction and extensive infarction in this patient. And so don't omit that the patient having atrial fibrillation because it should be used in risk stratification. And of course, it affects the antithrombotic management as mentioned in the guidelines because this patient needs to be put in Charles Vasco score, which of course would be at least one here. We are speaking about an ischemic patient and so he would need long-term oral anticoagulation. So what are the ECG features of atrial fibrillation? Let's, let's remind ourselves. Absence of persistent P waves replaced by fine prolateral waves or just fine oscillation, either coarse or fine AF. 
irregular irregularity. This explains why, of course, due to the chaotic iterative activity. And iterative rate is nearly 400 to 600 because of the extremely chaotic iterative rhythm here. Of course, we are not going to count the iterative rate, but just to mention that the iterative rate is extremely rapid in case of atrial fibrillation. Let's see this ECG example here. We can see that the patient has AF with rapid ventricular rate here. And we can see that from ST depression, which is nearly upsloping, especially in V1, 2, 3, and 4, suggesting that these ST depressions suggest myocardial ischemia. And so I suspect that this AF occur on top of myocardial ischemia, like acute coronary syndrome, or even non STEMI, which may be here sometimes with serious STEMI. Also, here we can see that the patient is having atrial fibrillation as there is irregular irregularity with absence of persistent P wave. But we can see here that the patient has a C elevation V1, V2, V3, and V4. So, are speaking here about anterior STEMI, and this anterior STEMI is complicated by atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate. Let's now move to the ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia, in case of acute myocardial infarction, can occur by two mechanisms. Either abnormally automatic focus inside the ventricle itself, left or right ventricle are called in site of infarction, and also delayed after depolarization due to abnormal calcium handling, which is a subtype of triggered activity. So both can cause ventricular tachycardia, and this can occur in case of the acute ischemic injury itself or after reperfusion either by PCI or by thrombolytic, the patient may have a reperfusion injury leading to ventricular tachycardia. So of course we remember that in the lecture of ventricular tachycardia, we classified ventricular tachycardia according to complex morphology into monomorphic showing regular and similar morphology, pleomorphic showing more than one morphology with little change in the axis, and polymorphic with there is irregular and completely variable morphology with continuous change in the axis, which can be polymorphic with normal QT interval or polymorphic with prolonged QT interval, which we called to set the point. Let's see this ECG example here. We can see here is the patient having regular white complex tachycardia and it is monomorphic VT based on the similar complex morphology and axis. Here as well, we can see that the patient is having monomorphic VT and this was his first ECG when the patient presented to the ER as he came to the ER presenting with dizziness, lightheadedness, and near syncope. And when this patient received VC shock and then another is used repeated, it revealed this. The patient has anterior STEMI, which is nearly extensive anterior STEMI. So this emphasizes the importance of having an ECG during the episode and another ECG after termination because it can reveal the cause. And the cause here, it was not scar-related VT. It is not, for example, any type of chanelopathies or long QT syndrome. It is just extensive anterior STEMI, and this patient needs primary PCI. What's the difference between polymorphic VT and pleomorphic? VT. Polymorphic shows continuous change in the complex axis and morphology, and this usually occurs with acute myocardial infarction, long QT interval, and electrolyte disorders. Whereas bleomorphic VT show more than one distinct complex morphology during the same VT episode, but not continuously changing, and the axis is nearly the same or with minimal change. Bleomorphic VT usually occurs with a scar-related VT because it is a fixed re-entering circuit around the scar, which, which may show slight change in the morphology during the episode. But pleomorphic VT doesn't usually occur in acute myocardial infarction. So here we are going to focus on polymorphic VT, not the pleomorphic. So monomorphic may occur in myocardial infarction, then polymorphic VT. Let's see this example here. We can see that there is a slight change in the complex morphology during the episode, but not continuously changing and the axis is nearly the same. So this is bleomorphic VT, which is not common to occur in case of acute myocardial infarction. Whereas here we can see continuous change in the complex morphology and nearly change in the axis, which suggests polymorphic VT. Also here we can see that the patient is having polymorphic ventricular tachycardia as the complex at the first, for example, are predominantly negative, since they turn to be predominantly positive with continuous change in the morphology and the axis. And this occurred here on top of long QT interval, so this is polymorphic VT with long QT interval, which we call, of course, Tursan de Point. Sometimes it may occur in case of acute myocardial infarction if there is associated electrolyte disorders or associated medications that prolong the QT interval. Sometimes myocardial ischemia may prolong the QT interval, although it is not very common, 
but usually the polymorphic VT that we see in patients with acute myocardial infarction is a polymorphic VT with normal QT interval. So this is an example here of polymorphic VT in which we can see that the complex here are this continuous change in morphology, but they are predominantly positive and so the axis is not continuously changing. And so it is polymorphic VT with normal QT interval which can occur with myocardial ischemia, structural heart disease, and channelopathies other than long QT syndrome based on nearly the same axis during the episodes. Let's now learn some subtypes of ventricular tachycardia or ventricular tachyarrhythmia that may occur in the context of myocardial ischemia. We have, of course, non-sustained VT, which is a one of VT less than 30 seconds. As we can see here, for example, that we can see four consecutive ventricular premature pates at a heart rate of about 130 to 140. So this is non-sustained VT and not uncommon to see a patient with non-sustained VT during MI, which in the case of course, a high risk prognosis, and sometimes it may generate to be sustained VT leading to hemodynamic compromise in some cases. Also the VT may occur at a relatively slower rate, but also it is more than 100 because it is still tachycardia, it is not a normal heart rate. So slow VT for example, as we can see here, it may occur at a heart rate of nearly 120 beat per minute. And sometimes this type of slow VT may occur in the context of myocardial ischemia, although not very common. Usually it is seen in patients with structural heart disease like ischemic LV dysfunction or dilated cardiomyopathy, but sometimes it may occur in myocardial ischemia. So slow VT means that the heart rate is usually less than 150 feet per minute, but it is still tachycardia and still more than 100 feet per minute. Let's see another malignant form of ventricular tachycardia, which is the ventricular flutter. As we can see here, that the patients have continuous sine wave pattern without any identifiable B waves or T waves, and the rate is more than 200 beat per minute, and usually hemodynamically unstable because the heart rate is extremely rapid. This is an extreme and malignant form of VT with loss of the isoelectric line in between complex, and that's why we call it ventricular flutter, because as an intra flutter, we know we don't see any isoelectric line between the flutter waves as an intra tachycardia, for example. And so they call it ventricular flutter. It is not very common to be seen, but if you see it, it is a malignant form, and most of this patient will be shocked. And so you need to give urgent DC shock to save this patient, and then repeat the ACG after termination of ventricular flutter. And so it is usually short-lived and degenerate into VF. This patient will not sustain a long time because his blood pressure would be unstable and would be extremely low due to the extremely rapid rate. Then the pulseless VT, of course, is a very, very important type of VT because it is a type of cardiac arrest. It is one of the two shock of a rhythm defined VF because it shows regular wide complex tachycardia, but the patient have no epical or carotid pulsation. So by ECG, pulseless VT is just an ordinary type monomorphic VT, but it is a clinical diagnosis because you see the patient, he is gasping, and when you check the apical or carotid pulse, you would not find any apical or cardiac pulsation. And so you need to start CPR because this patient is in a cardiac arrest. So pulseless VT is a combined clinical and ECG diagnosis. And then let's move to the most, most grave type, which is the VF. VF, of course, is the second type of shock of rhythm characterized by irregular angulating chaotic ventricular rhythm with no well-defined complex. And of course, in this type, you would not find any apical carotid pulsation. There is no organized ventricular contraction. So VF, of course, is distinct from VT. And of course, it is very, very common to occur in acute myocardial infarction. When I hear about a patient with myocardial infarction who is hemodynamically stable, and all of a sudden he developed cardiac arrest, I would suspect VF, a shock of rhythm. And so I would expect that he would need a DC shock. So VF is very common, and VF can occur in any type of myocardial infarction due to abnormal automaticity or triggered activity. And VF, of course, is clearly distinguishable from VT. Remember, any MI, even if small in size, can precipitate VT up to VF and sudden cardiac death, even lateral STEMI, even inferior STEMI, even non-STEMI. Any type of myocardial infarction can lead to abnormal automaticity and can lead to triggered activity due to delayed after depolarization, resulting in VF and sudden cardiac death, and your patient is lost. So please don't say that VT and VF occur only with extensive infarction like extensive anterior STEMI. Any type of MI can lead to it. Now let's move to an important topic in the myocardial ischemia, which is reperfusion.
injury. Reperfusion MI can occur through PCI or through thrombolysis, and this can result in chest pain, reperfusion arrhythmia like sinus bradycardia, like IVR, like PT. Some cardiologists sometimes they don't believe why why reperfusion injury can result in this. Let's see this example here. We have a segment of myocardium which was receiving blood supply here through the coronary artery, and then there was a blood clot or thrombus that occluded this artery, resulting in ischemic injury. So this patient now developed chest pain and develop also may develop significant tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia. When the patients have successful revascularization, either using, for example, PCI or thrombolytic, with the restoration of the blood flow and the high premic blood flow, this results to a similar type of injury to the ischemic injury itself. So with acute ischemia, the patient develop injuries that can result in symptoms and tachyarrhythmias, and also with the successful reperfusion, the patient may develop suddenly chest pain. So when your patient develop chest pain during primary PCI, once you open the artery, don't be terrified that your patient would be lost. No, it is a good sign that he has viable tissue and with the restoration of blood flow, the high premia resulted in reperfusion injury. So reperfusion arrhythmia may be a strange term that some doctors may not understand, but as we know that reperfusion injury can lead to a myocardial injury the same as ischemic injury, even that it can cause chest pain and acute rising cardiac markers, which is called early peaking. And of course, any doctor who has taken chest in the CCU, he can see that the patient with a STEMI, when he has successful reperfusion, he can detect an early peaking in the cardiac markers like the troponin or the CK due to the successful reperfusion and the wash of the cardiac markers to the circulation, up to causing dynamically significant arrhythmias. Of course, one of the very famous reperfusion arrhythmia is the accelerated atrioventricular rhythm. And you remember, of course, that we have put a lecture about this type of unique arrhythmia. Of course, it is characterized by wide complex rhythm at a heart rate between 50 and 100 feet per minute. So it is not tachycardic, it is not bradycardic. It is characterized by complete AP dissociation because there is a ventricular activity in the ventricle that is completely independent from the atrial activity faced by the ST nodes and it may be intermittent or may be sustained in some cases, but it indicates a good prognosis. So remember this famous ECG it could, in which we can say that there is regular wide complex rhythm at heart rate of about 56 feet per minute, there is complete AV dissociation and here it is intermittent, so this is accelerated atrioventricular rhythm or sometimes we abbreviate it as IVR. Some may ask me what's the difference between IVR and VT and how I can differentiate between them? The answer is simple. IVR show a heart rate that is normal between 50 and 100 feet per minute, whereas VT show a rapid heart rate as it is called ventricular tachycardia heart rate more than 100. So the difference is in the rate. IVR is a controlled rate while VT is a tachycardic rate. But the same mechanism, the same ECG features, the only difference is cervix. Remember, the most specific reperfusion arrhythmia, of course, is IVR and the most common is not either. The most common is sinus bradycardia. So it is very common to see that patients with successful reperfusion, they may have sinus bradycardia and they can tell you that, oh doctor, I have feel, I felt chest pain, but the most specific is either. And when you see either, you should not be terrified or suspected as VT. No, it is a good sign. Either is a good sign, as we mentioned in the lecture of either. The last question in this lecture, can supraventricular tachycardia occur in the context of myocardial ischemia? And of course, the same question applies to the atrial flutter. Of course, myocardial ischemia may trigger the induction of SVT, but in the presence of the substrate for occurrence of SVT. For example, dual evenodal physiology or accessory pathway. So if my patients have dual evenodal physiology in the form of slow pathway and fast pathway, or my patient is having an accessory pathway since first, so with the myocardial ischemia, it can alter the conduction velocity or the refractoriness of these pathways, and so it may precipitate the occurrence of SVT during the context of myocardial ischemia. So it is not a direct cause, but it is just like a precipitating cause sometimes in the presence of substrate for SVT. And so the same applies to atrial flutter. Now at the end of our lecture, we understood today the types and mechanisms of tachyarrhythmias that can occur in the setting of acute myocardial ischemia. We reminded ourselves again with the three basic mechanisms of tachyarrhythmia and which of them are applicable in case of acute myocardial ischemia. And we learned the types of arrhythmias that can occur in patients with acute myocardial ischemia. And our take-home message today 
any type of arrhythmia may occur on top of myocardial ischemia, and so you should always exclude it as a precipitating cause. In patient with tachyarrhythmia, excludes please myocardial ischemia as an acute event, and always, always repeat the ECG after termination of the tachyarrhythmia. Thank you very much for your watching, and wait for the next lecture, which will be the bradyarrhythmia in acute coronary syndrome. Thank you.